Thanks for the introduction. It's really good to be here. Um, I think this is my first talk with the Fields Institute, but um, I did my undergraduate at University of Toronto and master's there as well. So it's nice to be in some sense virtually back in, in Toronto um, and seeing some familiar faces. So it's really good to be here. Um, so the work that I'm gonna be talking about today is uh, joint with Wan Lin Lee and Eric Stubley. Wan Lin is now a assist professor at the Washington University in St. Louis and Eric is now working for a tech company. Um, so they've both gone off to do different things, but this is presenting on work that we did while we were all postdoctoral researchers together at the CRM um, last year. So we do have a uh, preprint on some of the results. Uh, it hasn't gone up on archive yet, um, mainly just because there's one result that we'd really like to try to prove and include if we can. And maybe at the end, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but if anyone does want to see sort of full proofs of any of the results we present, feel free to email me. My email is listed right here. Um, hopefully everyone can see that. Um, and yeah, I'd be happy to talk further about any of the results here. But I wanted to start by just diving in a little bit to uh, sort of a motivation for the question that we're asking. And really this question that we're exploring today is a question about class groups. And I want to do this thing where I compare the number field setting to the function field setting to really give an insight into what are the similarities and differences between the two. So throughout, we're gonna have our base field be either the rationals or um, FQ adjoint T, rational functions in one parameter. And within here, we're going to have a ring, either the integers or polynomials over a finite field FQ. In each case, we can consider finite extensions of this base field. Uh, in the case of Q, we just get number fields. And in the case of FQT, we're going to get finite extensions of FQT, but we can interpret this in a different way. We can interpret these as function fields of smooth projective curves. And the choice of extension, the choice of map from FQT into K determines a finite map from the curve to P1. And so we're assuming that this data comes equipped with the, with the curve. Also in both of these pictures, we can associate a corresponding class group. So in the case of K being the number field, we take the ring of integers and we compute the ideal class group, fractional ideals of this ring, modulo principal ideals. And on the function field side, we're going to do V divisors, so essentially formal sums of closed points on the curve, modulo, again, principal divisors. And what we're going to see throughout is that there's a lot of similarities in how these behave throughout. So that's our setup. And the question that I want to ask is one about the structure of class groups. And in general, and specifically about the L torsion um, for a specific prime L. Now, Typically, questions about sort of the precise structure of class groups is rather hard to come by. It's usually a lot easier to talk in terms of statistics. You know, how large can it get? How small can it get? If you vary k in a family, what are sort of the averages and the moments of the distribution of these L torsion groups? Um, so this comes up most prominently in the cohen lenstra heuristics, which make strong predictions about how often you should see each of these subgroups appear. However, there are certain families, certain sets of uh, extensions K where the L torsion is much more structured. And one that I want to uh, dive into here is what happens if you take your base field F and you adjoin an Lth root. In this case, the L torsion has a lot of extra structure that we can take advantage of. And that's what I want to explore today. So the question is, if we adjoin the Lth root of an element of this ring R, whether integers or polynomials over FQ, what can we say about the structure of the L torsion? So I'm going to be dividing this up into four boxes. We're going to consider the number field side on the left and the function field side on the right. And also we're going to look at the L equals two case first, which is more classical. Um, this is stuff that's more well known, um, but then we're going to move into the L greater than or equal to three case, which is, which is a little bit more recent. <clears throat> so let's start with, number fields with L equals two. And this is, I'm just labeling with genus theory. In this case, we're adjoining the square root of an integer to Q, and we're looking at the two torsion and the ideal class group. The way you study this is just by saying, okay, you're taking the square root of something. Um, this N divides into primes and each of those primes 
ramifies. There's some prime ideal whose square is the p dividing n. And so this prime ideal is two torsion. And it turns out that as long as two doesn't ramify, so if we sort of make this condition that ensures that two itself is not a ramified prime, then this is the entire explanation. So this is what Gauss's genus theory discusses. He also discusses the one mod four case or the not one mod four case, but to put it simply, as long as two does not ramify, then the two torsion is generated by these prime ideals. And the only relation between them is that if you take the product of all of them, you do get a principal ideal, namely the ideal generated by the square root of n. What we see in the function field case is very similar. So now we're joining the square root of a polynomial. And what this means is that we're looking at divisors on the curve y squared equals f of t, where y is the square root of f that we're adjoining to the function field. Uh, a piece of language that I'll often use in this setting is we'll talk about the Jacobian variety of C because the ideal, the divisor class group in this setting, especially if we look at the torsion subgroups, is going to be exactly the torsion subgroups of the FQ points of the Jacobian. Now, in this context, again, we'll make some technical assumptions, um, which I'll discuss a little bit later. But an example in this situation you can think of is a special case is when f of t is a cubic polynomial. So in this case, we get an elliptic curve. And anytime that you have a root of the equation, the cubic polynomial defining the elliptic curve, you can define a principal divisor, which is the multiple of two. Namely, you take the elliptic curve and then if it vanishes at one, for example, then the rational function t minus one has a zero of order two at that root and then a pole of order two at the point at infinity. And so what this means is that if we divide this divisor by two, we get a non-principal divisor, which is two torsion in the Jacobian. And again, this is essentially all that can happen under certain technical assumptions the two torsion is just generated by these closed points minus an appropriate multiple of the point at infinity. We have to worry about the fact here that the, the closed point P could have high degree. So in this example, I'm just taking the divisor of a degree one irreducible, but we could be taking the root of some higher degree irreducible. But the irreducibles dividing F completely determine the two torsion. And once again, the only relation is that if you take the sum of all the points defined in this way, then you get this principal divisor, namely the divisor of y. Now, these two assumptions that q and the degree of f are odd, one of them can actually be easily removed. So we only did this degree of f being odd because this guarantees that there's a single point at infinity. So we can do this sort of minus two times the point at infinity construction. However, you can actually relax that constraint and if there's not a unique point at infinity, if infinity is itself not ramified, then you have to consider differences of the ramification points, differences of the roots of f. But this can be solved easily. However, requiring q to be odd in this case is a bit more important. If q is a power of two, then this question becomes a little bit more complicated and outside of the scope of this talk. Putting what we've seen together, there's really sort of one principle which is that when you adjoin a square root and want to look at the two torsion, if there are no ramified primes of characteristic two, then you can completely describe the two torsion in terms of irreducible divisors of the thing that you're taking the square root of. Um, so in this case, L is two. Oops. So L is two. So if you take square roots of irreducible divisors and there's a single relation, namely that the product of the generators is the divisor of some rational function, is some principal divisor. So that's the situation in the case L equals two for both number fields and function fields. It's essentially the same picture. Now, before we move on to L greater than equal to three, I'm going to make a stronger assumption, which is to say, I'm not just gonna take an Lth root of R, I want to take an Lth root of an irreducible element. And this has the effect of making the two torsion groups in when you adjoin a square root, it makes these trivial uh, under this assumption that there's no ramified primes of characteristic L. Uh, so this is similar to saying that if you take y squared equals a degree three irreducible cubic, there's no two torsion on that elliptic curve, no non-trivial two torsion. 
However, even under this assumption, we do get non-trivial L torsion when we adjoin L roots. So the number theory setting I'm going to talk about on the next slide, and then I'll talk after that about how it generalizes or what the analog is in the function field setting. Before I move on, any questions about uh, the setup so far? Okay. By the way, I'm happy to be interrupted at any time and I'll keep an eye on the chat as well. So feel free to let me know if you have any concerns or questions. So let's take L to be some prime greater than or equal to three and consider the L torsion when we adjoin an Lth root of an integer and specifically a prime n in this case. So this is a question that was explored. I mean, it's been explored a lot, but one of the sort of key pieces of background that I want to emphasize is due to Frank Caligari and Matthew Emerton. So among many other things, um, they were looking at deformations of uh, modular forms and they managed to find conditions under which this L torsion in the class group is not cyclic. Uh, so using their techniques, they found this condition, this sort of strange congruence condition that if you multiply I to the I over all I from one to N minus one over two, and you check whether this is an Lth power mod N, this congruence condition is enough to guarantee that there's actually a Z mod LZ squared inside the class group of Q adjoin L root of N. Now, this is not an if and only if, there are um, fields of the form Q adjoin L root of N that have a Z mod LZ squared in them, but do not satisfy this congruence condition. However, several years later, uh, Preston Wake and Carl Wang Erickson took the results of Caligari Emerton and sort of generalized them and put them into a new context, namely the studying of certain cup products in Galois cohomology. And this Lth power condition on the left turns out to actually be related to the vanishing of a particular cup product. So using this, these techniques, a couple of years later, Carl Schaefer and Eric Stubley, uh, Eric Stubley being the one who is one of the collaborators on this new project, managed to prove a biconditional version of this. So they show that if instead of just this one congruence condition, you look at a set of congruence conditions, then you can relate a copy of Z mod L Z squared appearing in the class group. That will happen if and only if some collection of congruence conditions is satisfied or some subset of this collection of congruence conditions are Lth powers. And the results that we'll be talking about today in the function field setting, we can think of as generalizations of this schaefer stubley result or not generalizations, analogs in the function field setting. So are there ways that we can look at certain congruence conditions and learn about non-cyclic L torsion in the class groups when you join L roots? So we now enter the fourth box in the four boxes. We've dealt with L equals two. We've dealt with L greater than equal to three in the number field setting. Now let's look at L greater than equal to three in the function field setting. Uh, some parameters, L is going to be prime, Q is a prime power co-prime to L, and we're taking an irreducible polynomial over FQ with degree co-prime to L. Now, just as in the case with hyperelliptic curves, when L is two, uh, this degree co-prime to L condition is not that necessary. That more is a technical condition. We can rephrase many of our results, even if we don't have that. Uh, we just need to be a little bit more careful with how we treat the point at infinity, because um, there's not a unique one if we remove this assumption. However, the second condition is very essential. This completely changes the behavior of the situation if the characteristic is L. So um, that's just something to keep in mind is that the irreducibility of F is very important. And the fact that Q is co-prime to L is very important. Um, the degree being co-prime to L just helps us sort of phrase the results in a, as nice a way as possible. So with this setup, we're going to consider a super elliptic curve. So a super elliptic curve is when you take some polynomial and you take y to the l equals that polynomial in t. So what we're doing is to the function field, we're adjoining an lth root of this polynomial f of t. And once again, the class group that we're considering of this uh, super elliptic curve can be written as a degree component times the fq points of the Jacobian of this curve. And so when we're looking at L torsion of the class group, we're also looking at L torsion of the FQ rational points of this Jacobian. 
bit of notation before we state our first result. We're going to set gamma to be the order of q mod l. So what is the smallest positive integer such that q to the gamma is 1 mod l? And this is really the object that we want to study. What is the L rank of C? The L rank is the largest value of R such that Z mod LZ to the R is a subgroup of the FQ points of the Jacobian. So this number R, R sub L of C, gives us a complete understanding of what the L torsion in this class group looks like. So our first result is the following, is that we have this upper bound on the L rank that can be expressed purely in terms of the parameters. So there's a GCD of the degree and this gamma, the order of Q mod L, minus one. And we take that factor and multiply it by L minus one over gamma. And as long as the right-hand side is positive, then so is the left-hand side. So this gives us, in some sense, both an upper bound and a lower bound. So already this has some nice implications. So for example, just by writing down values of d and gamma um, whose GCD is not one, we can immediately generate examples of curves with non-trivial L torsion uh, for any prime L. There's this question about whether this upper bound is sharp. And what I'll say is that in many cases, the answer is actually no, in the sense that for any particular L, Q, and D, you only get a finite set of isomorphism classes of curves. And for certain very small L, Q, and D, the set of curves is just so small that it doesn't attain this upper bound. However, when we're looking at values of L, Q, and D for which the set of curves is in some sense large enough, it seems to be the case that we're able to attain this upper bound. This seems like something that's hard to prove because we're trying to prove something about you know, a finite set being able to attain this upper bound. Um, we believe there's something that can be said about you know, if you fix L and Q and allow D to vary in a set that has a constant GCD with gamma so that this upper bound is preserved, um, you might be able to say that in that infinite family, the upper bound is always attained. Um, we, that's still just you know, speculation. We haven't proven that yet, but it appears to be true based on the data. Um, okay, so this has a lot of parameters in it. Um, I think it's helpful to look at special cases and see like, what does this really say? So if we set L to equal three, for example, now we're looking at Q curves of the form Y cubed equals F of T. And it's helpful to say, okay, what does this imply? Well, there's not a lot that can happen if L is three. Gamma can only be one or two, and the GCD of D and gamma can also only be one or two. And so what we end up with is the following result is that if you take y cubed equals f of t, where f is irreducible over f cubed, and q and the degree are co-primed to three, then essentially there's only two things that can happen. If d is even and q is two mod three, then you do get a non-cyclic three torsion in the class group. And in every other case, there is no, the, the three torsion is trivial. So that's one consequence of the, the theorem above. If we set L equals five, we start to see something a little bit more interesting. Um, so there's various values that gamma can take and various values that the GCD of D and gamma can take. In each case, we can compute the upper and lower bound, but we see that once we get to gamma at least two, that the upper and lower bound no longer agree. So Mr. after this- Jonathan, yes. could you just remind me, uh, gamma is the order of- um... The order of Q modulo L. Uh, the order of the power of L that divides Q. Uh, yeah, so or, we're looking at the power of Q. The order or the power? The, the order. Oh, the order, okay. So we're looking for the smallest gamma such that Q to the gamma minus one Got is it. a multiple of L. Sure. Um, so I'll actually just quickly skip ahead to this. Um, this condition that Q to the gamma is one mod L um, is exactly the same as requiring that FQ to the gamma contains L roots of unity. So this is sort of the way we should be thinking about gamma is that it's the degree of the extension obtained by adjoining L roots of unity. So what we do in this situation when we have, uh, yes, so we were talking about our first theorem. And what I'll say is that we're going to now prove a result that's a little bit simil more similar to the schaefer stubley result um, that uses congruence conditions. So we can actually show that several of these cases don't occur. You will never get something that's 
you'll never get, if gamma is two and the GCD of the EN gamma is two, then it turns out that uh, a five rank of one is not possible. And likewise, if gamma is four and D is a multiple of four, we'll see that a five rank of two is not possible. Now there's still sort of a, oops, an ambiguity here where you know, the five rank, once you've computed all the parameters, gamma is four, D is a multiple of four, it's still possible for the five rank to be one or three. And so what we'll see is that we can disambiguate between these two just by checking a set of congruence conditions. So that's the motivation for our next theorem, which is a little bit more complicated to state. What we're going to do is consider the splitting field of this T to the L minus one. So over a field extension that contains all L roots of unity, we're going to factor F of T, which was irreducible over the base ring, FQT. It now factors into irreducibles over FQ to the gamma of T. Uh, these irreducibles will all have the same degree, degree and Frobenius will send one to the other. So if we act on it by Frobenius, so raising the coefficients to the Qth power, we can arrange these factors so that F1 goes to F2, F2 goes to F3, and so on, cycling through all the way back to the beginning. And now I'm just going to drop these uh, complicated expressions on the screen. Um, what they mean isn't so important right now, but what I really want to emphasize is this structure, that I'm defining these H sub n of t's, which are obtained by taking powers of elements of this ring and multiplying them together over a certain interval. And then what I'm doing is I'm taking all of those elements and I'm checking how many of them are elf powers modulo some element. How many of them are elf powers mod F1? So this very much is an analog of the results that Caligari Emerton all the way through uh, Schaefer and Stubbley were examining. They took this product of powers and checked whether it's an elf power in a certain congruence ring. So again, the exact form, not so important right now, but let's just say that we have these definitions. We've computed these values Hn over this extension field, and we check how many of them are elf powers. What we can then say is that the L rank has this stronger upper bound, where we say that's less than or equal to the size of T minus one times L minus one over gamma. Now I say it's stronger because the size of this set T is bounded above by GCD of D and gamma. And that's given by this condition here that gamma has to divide D times N minus one. So if everything were an elf power, then the size of T would be GCD of D and gamma. So in general, this size of T will be smaller. So this gives a stronger upper bound than theorem one. But we also get stronger lower bounds in the sense that if this right-hand side is at least two, then the left-hand side is also at least two. So this gives us this analogous if and only if condition. Uh, Jonathan, again, can I interrupt? Um, the, yeah. the original result of um, Emerton mm -hmm. um, doesn't give a bound for the rank, right? It just says that it's not six. No, that's true, yes. Okay, um, but you're getting actual bounds. Hmm? Exactly, yeah. Okay. So all we can say about um, the number field side of things um, was they gave conditions under which you have a lower bound of two to the L rank. Okay. Um, now, I will say that in certain cases, Schaefer and Subley were able to prove upper bounds as well. Um, and the upper bounds actually take a similar form to these. Um, so the upper bounds are not completely new to the function field case. Um, so if I mean, again, they, the, the criterion was in certain so Galois cohomological terms. Yes. And then they what they interpret that, that Galois cohomology statement in an explicit numerical way to get that. Exactly. I see, I see. Yeah. So we'll, I'll talk a little bit more towards the end of this talk about sort of how one interprets these products. But essentially what happens is that for one of these products to be an elf power, this is essentially checking whether a cup product in a certain local Galois cohomology group is zero. And when that happens, you can actually guarantee that um, a certain cohomology element lifts to a uh, cohomology element of a representation one dimension higher. And by sort of building up these representations, you can sort of construct elements of the class group.
Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so as was asked, um, there, yeah, so there's an upper bound here, which I didn't discuss. Actually, there is an upper bound in the number field case as well. Um, the one new thing here is that we can actually get the L rank to be at least three. So this is not something that's a subset of any of the previous results that um, if we know that gamma over two is an element of the set T and gamma is greater than two, then we can actually get L rank being at least three. So this is actually pretty powerful because it gives us lots of examples with Z models at cubed as a subgroup of the FQ points of the Jacobian. So just an example to see this in action. Let's look at curves of the form Y to the seven equals F of T. We're going to work over FQ. Uh, three is a primitive root mod seven. So gamma is six. Three has order six mod seven. And we're going to look at curves of the form Y to the seven equals a degree 12 irreducible polynomial. So there are about 7,000 isomorphism classes of curves of this form. Of these, we can check this condition. And note that the second condition here only requires checking one thing. It just requires checking, is gamma over two an element of T? In other words, is the polynomial H sub gamma over two an elf power mod this factor F1? And so we can do that. And what we get is about 1,000 of them satisfy this property, that H3 is an L power mod F1. And so for these thousand curves, we immediately find that the F3 points of the Jacobian do have a Z mod 7 Z cubed, at least in, their, in this Jacobian. It might be interesting to point out that 1,000 is roughly 1 7th of 7,000. And this is essentially what we expect to see um, because we're checking whether an element of this finite ring is an Lth power. And this finite ring, the group of units is a multiple of L by definition of gamma. And so there's about a one in L chance of being an Lth power. So if we assume that these HNs are roughly equidistributed in the group of units, then we would expect about one, of, one over L of them to satisfy this condition that gamma over two is in T. So, if we set the parameters up correctly so that gamma divides D, gamma is even, et cetera, is greater than two, then we'd expect about one over L curves with these parameters to have L rank at least three. Now, this is just a heuristic. Um, there are very many natural questions we could ask about, can we prove things about the distribution of curves with various L ranks? And this is a topic of ongoing exploration where we don't have any precise results yet, but it's something that we're trying to look into. OK, so I mentioned that there were these two theorems, one that takes advantage of these congruence conditions and the set T, and one that doesn't. And the second one really does rely on the results of the first one. So I really want to dig into this first theorem and spend most of the time talking about that. So we have this super elliptic curve, y to the l equals f of t. Um, we can compute this genus by riemann Hurwitz. And if we now look at the FQ bar points of the L torsion, this we can predict exactly. It's just going to be uh, Z mod LZ to the power of two times the genus. What we're going to do in order to study the FQ points is take advantage of two automorphisms on this curve. Namely, we have Frobenius, which raises X and Y to the Qth power. And we also have this automorphism I'm going to define as lambda. And what this does is it multiplies the Y coordinate by an Lth root of unity. And by playing these two automorphisms off of each other, we're going to compute the action of Frobenius, but specifically on pieces of the, the L torsion that are cut out by lambda. So what, I, what do I mean by cut out by lambda? So let's take a look at this automorphism lambda. Um, lambda has certain fixed points. So namely, the point at infinity is fixed by this automorphism. But also, whenever y is 0, we get a fixed point. And so what that means is that whenever we have a root of f of t, then the divisor xi comma 0 minus infinity uh, is pointwise fixed by this automorphism lambda. And therefore, when we look at the endomorphism of lambda acting on the Jacobian, acting on the space of divisors mod principal divisors, this element is fixed. So what that means is that this is an element of the kernel of lambda minus 1. And it turns out that actually 
the kernel of lambda minus one is spanned by divisors of this form. Once again, we have this relation that the sum of all of the roots is just the divisor of the function y. And so what we get is that this kernel is d minus one dimensional. And so far, this description is exactly as in the hyperelliptic case. The difference is that the full L torsion of the Jacobian is now d minus one times L minus one dimensional. And unless L is two, that means that this kernel is not everything. And so we're going to have to look further, deeper into the L torsion to see what all is there. And the way that we can access the rest of it is by taking higher powers of lambda minus one. So we have this first piece of the filtration, which is the kernel of lambda minus one, generated by these divisors di, quotient by their sum. But then we can look at the kernel of lambda minus one squared, the kernel of lambda minus one cubed, and so on, all up to the kernel of lambda minus one to the l minus one. Now, if we expand this out and sort of look at what this is doing, what is this action on the endomorphism ring, we can actually show that this automorphism here is a multiple of L. And in particular, it must annihilate the entire L torsion. So we get that this lambda minus one to the L minus one, its kernel has to contain the entirety of the L torsion. So if we look at the action on the L torsion by some dimension considerations, what we end up finding is that the sub quotients of this filtration are all isomorphic to each other. They have to all be the same dimension. And so if we look at v1 quotient v0, we actually get another d minus one dimensional space, which is maps isomorphically onto v0, and so on all the way up the filtration. And this will come in very useful to us. Because what we're going to do now is study Frobenius. And we're going to start by studying Frobenius on this smallest stage of the filtration, where it's very explicit. So why are we studying Frobenius? Well, the fixed points of Frobenius are exactly the FQ rational divisors. And so if we want to study RLC, that's nothing but the dimension of the one eigenspace. So what we're going to do is find how often does one occur as an eigenvalue. Now, there's this commutation relation that we can check, that if you do lambda and then Frobenius, it's the same as doing Frobenius and then lambda to the Q. And using this, we can see that if you have an element of v0, Frobenius must stay in v0. If you have an element of v1, Frobenius of it must stay in v1. And what that means is that we must actually have a block diagonal matrix, where each block is d minus 1 by d minus 1. So this top left block just means that if you plug in an element of v0, it stays there. These two blocks in the second column say that if you plug in an element of v1, it could get modified by elements of v0. Well, v0 is contained in v1. So you have this 2 times d minus 1 dimensional space on which Frobenius acts, and so on. And the nice thing about a blocked upper triangular structure like this is that we can compute the characteristic polynomial of the whole thing just by multiplying the characteristic polynomial in each subquotient. So if we know the characteristic polynomial of each of these subdiagonal blocks, then we can just multiply them together to get the characteristic polynomial on the whole thing. Now, as mentioned, because we know v0 very explicitly, we can compute Frobenius very explicitly. So what does Frobenius do? It sends d1 to d2, d2 to d3, all the way up to d sub little d, and then back to d1. So we just get this permutation group cycling through um, the d generators, but then we quotient by the fact that the sum of them is 0 in the L-torsion subgroup. And what this means is that we have the standard representation of the cyclic group. And so the eigenvalues of this action are exactly the non-trivial dth roots of unity. We get every dth roots of unity exactly once, but we miss out on one itself because we've quotient out by the unique fixed vector of this permutation. But now that we know that these subquotients are isomorphic to each other, we can take advantage of that to compute the Frobenius eigenvalues further up the filtration. So we have this result that if you have an eigenvector in Vj, for example, in Vj mod Vj minus one, and you look at what lambda minus one does to it, it actually multiplies the Frobenius eigenvalue by Q. And this is essentially a direct computation. If you apply Frobenius to lambda minus one of V, you use the commutation relation to swap lambda and Frobenius, and you get this lambda to the Q minus one, oops. Uh, that factors, but then the key fact here is that lambda minus one squared of V 
takes you two steps down the filtration. And that's in the stage of the filtration that we're quotienting by. And so in the quotient that goes to zero, what that means is that lambda minus one of V is fixed by lambda if we're working mod Vj minus two. And so all of these terms in this sum here, lambda to the q minus one all the way down to one, these all fix the vector lambda minus one of v. So we're just adding lambda minus one v to itself q times. So this shows that the whatever the eigenvalue c is, it gets multiplied by q when you apply one step, one application of lambda minus one. And so this means that we can actually write out explicitly every single eigenvalue of the representation of Frobenius acting on the L torsion. So again, V0, we know exactly how that works. The eigenvalues of V0 are going to be all of the non-trivial dth roots of unity. Now, I've only written out those of them that are also powers of Q, but there are other non-trivial dth roots of unity in there. However, what we just saw in the previous lemma is that when we go up the tower, up in the filtration, we're asking, when do we reach a one? But we only reach a one if you start with a power of Q to begin with. Because you need to start with something such that when you multiply by Q inverse enough times, you eventually reach one. So most of these non-trivial dth roots of unity will not contribute to the one eigenspace. How many of them do? Well, we're just looking for which dth roots of unity are also powers of Q. But Q has this property that Q to the gamma is one mod L. In other words, Q is a gamma root of unity. So the number of powers of Q in this bottom stage is just GCD of D and gamma. That's the number of D roots of unity that are also gamma roots of unity, except what we have to exclude one because we're only looking at non-trivial D roots. Now for each of these, we can ask, okay, now how many times when you start at one of those and repeatedly multiply by Q inverse to work your way up um, the filtration, how often do we find one? And because Q has ordered gamma, we see a one once every gamma steps. And so each power of Q to the I in the base reaches one L minus one over gamma times. So altogether, how many ones do we see in this picture? Well, it's GCD of D gamma minus one. That's the number of powers of Q. That's the number of powers of Q that appear as eigenvalues for V zero. And each of them, when you go up through the filtration, will contribute L minus one over gamma times. So this concludes the proof of theorem one, because it tells us that the dimension of the one eigenspace is at most this value. And as long as this value is positive, then there is an eigenvector, a one eigenvector, and therefore RL of C is at least one. Any questions before I move on to the next stage? Okay. So the issue here that I want to point out is that algebraic multiplicity does not equal geometric multiplicity. In other words, you could have an eigenvector, or you could have an element here, this one, for example, that's an eigenvector in V2 mod V1, but not actually a true eigenvector in V2. It could be that when you apply a Frobenius to it, you get itself plus some element of V1. And so this is the issue that we need to address next. For the sake of time, I'm going to go somewhat quickly through some of these results, but I just want to sort of highlight some of the key equivalences that are used in the proof of theorem two. So yes, we have this issue is that the action of Frobenius on this L torsion is not necessarily semi-simple. You can have elements who, that look like eigenvectors on the quotient, but are not truly eigenvectors when you look at the full L torsion. So in this picture, in this eigenvalue picture, um, only these bolded values are actually guaranteed to correspond to eigenvectors of Frobenius. And the reason is because this element here, for example, um, when you apply Frobenius to it, you could pick up an extra copy of this Q from down here. We know that Frobenius has to preserve V1, so it can't get a contribution from this element here, for example, but it could pick up a contribution from down here. So the question that we need to explore is, is there any obstruction that prevents an eigenvector of Vj minus one from have, being the image under lambda minus one of a true eigenvector from one filtration step above. 
To do that, uh, we take the Galois closure of K. So K tilde, we obtain by adjoining L roots of unity. We have this uh, function y to the L equals F of T. So we got it by obtaining an L root. So if we want the Galois closure, we need to join L roots of unity. Turns out the Galois group is some semi-direct product. So we know how Frobenius and Lambda act with each other. They have this commutation relation that sets up the structure of a semi-direct product. We're going to define a few representations of this group. So first of all, there's a character that takes Frobenius and sends it to Q. And this is all happening mod L. So these are mod L characters. Uh, and it will, do, it will act trivially on Lambda. And we're also going to define a two-dimensional representation by having Q and 1 in the diagonal for Frobenius and acting on lambda by 1, 1, 0, 1. And we're going to see why we're defining these representations in particular. And that's because that this will actually help us to model how Frobenius and lambda interact on the L torsion of the Jacobi. The last thing I'll say is that both of these extend to representations on the full absolute Galois group of FQT because you can just define it to factor through G, the quotient G. So if you take a Frobenius eigenvector and you consider the smallest G-stable subspace containing this vector, well, what will this do? Well, you have this Frobenius eigenvector and applying lambda minus one will take it down through the filtration stage. And as you go down through the filtration stage, you pick up new eigenvectors of Frobenius as you go down. It's not necessarily true that lambda minus one of an eigenvector will itself be an eigenvector, but there is a basis of this WV under which it is spanned by these Frobenius eigenvectors. So what you get is that Frobenius and lambda, you can get, show that they act on this G-stable subspace in the following way, where this is what lambda is doing. Note that if you take lambda minus one, you get this upper trying, um, you get a bunch of ones on the super diagonal, which just corresponds to, you plug in an element and it moves it up through the filtration. On the other hand, this is just capturing the fact that at each stage in the filtration, you have a Frobenius eigenvector with eigenvalue q times as much. So these two matrices are exactly capturing the behavior that we saw Frobenius and lambda doing. And we can express these matrices in terms of the representations we've defined. It turns out that under these, the action of these two matrices, we can say that this WV is isomorphic to the kth symmetric power of lambda tensor with chi to the one minus k minus n, which is giving us the power of q that appears here. Now, this fact that we can sort of identify certain sort of well-structured representations inside the L-torsion motivates the following definition. So if you take an element n mod gamma and some dimension from z, uh, so k is actually gonna be the dimension minus one, but some integer from zero to L minus two, we're going to look at a class in H1 of the absolute Galois group valued in sim to the k rho tensor chi to the n. And we'll call this an eigenvector class if it satisfies a few conditions. First of all, there's a ramification condition. This basically says that we can actually can treat A as being in a Selmer group of a certain kind. And we want it to be non-trivial when we map it by this quotient map to just H1 of chi to the n. So this quotient map that takes the entire symmetric power and sends it down to the bottom right component. And what we can show is that eigenvectors, true eigenvectors in the L torsion in a certain filtration stage exist if and only if an eigenvector class in this H1 exists. So this H1 is actually detecting whether an eigenvector will lift all the way up. Uh, very roughly speaking, the proof goes through Coomer theory. So we get these subgroups of the L torsion and L torsion divisors have the property that L times them is principal. So you take the functions that appear there and take L roots of those and adjoin them to K tilde. So this gives you a nice way of taking subgroups of L torsion and defining extension of K tilde. And it turns out when, that when you define them this way, um, you have to be a little bit careful with units and things like that. But essentially, if you define thing, things this way, you get this dual structure where the G representation structure on W is dual to the G acting on by conjugation on these elementary unramified L extensions. Now, you can take these elementary unramified L extensions and use them to define uh, elements of H1 of these Galois groups. 
Um, so again, we're thinking of this as a G representation. Um, and it turns out that if you start with a subgroup that comes from this eigenvector, then these Galois groups, these elementary L extensions are just the duals of these representations that I showed you before that appear in the L torsion, these Kate symmetric powers tense, uh, twisted by characters. And so there's some details to check that all the conditions are satisfied, but the point is that you can take the representation that occurs in the L torsion and its dual will be a Galois group that appears as an L, a representation of G. And so this, this gives you this connection between eigenvectors and eigenvector classes. Now, one important result of this is that it, this allows us to count R sub L directly just by counting the number of pairs satisfying certain conditions for which an eigenvector class exists. So we're just saying um, N sort of parameterizes the base eigenvalue, the eigenvalues that appear in V0, and K parameterizes the filtration stage. The N plus K is one mod gamma just says that we want the Frobenius eigenvalue to be one. We, we want an eigenvalue one. And so under all of these conditions, an eigenvector class exists, tells you that a Frobenius eigenvector with the de desired properties in this filtration stage exists. So this means that we can study, we can place bounds and conditions on this L rank by studying the existence of classes and cohomology groups. So I just wanted to put a picture up here because that was a lot of technical stuff. So this sort of gives a bit of a picture of what's going on. So what we're doing is the K here is labeling the filtration stage. And the N here is labeling um, the powers of chi. And so in a sense, we really want to think of this as being a dual to the picture with the Frobenius eigenvalues I wrote before, where we have the powers of Q going sort of horizontally and vertically. And what happens is that here the circles correspond exactly to those positions where N plus K is one mod gamma. So these are all the places where if an eigenvector class exists in these circles, you do indeed get um, a contribution to the L rank. But we see in this picture, so here's an example of a curve where you know, there's these two eigenvectors in V0 that do not lift to eigenvectors in V1. And so these circles here that could have, could have contributed to the L rank if we had the full complete um, upper bound, um, they actually don't make it. They get stuck at V0 and don't lift to V1. So if we want to get some stronger upper and lower bounds on how many of these circles get filled in, how many true eigenvectors appear, we want to determine whether eigenvectors get stuck in V0 or they manage to make it up to V1 and beyond. And so that's basically what goes into proving theorem two. So if you have a eigenvector in V0 and you want to test whether it lifts to V1, by the proposition proved before, that turns into existence of certain eigenvector classes. And by doing some diagram chasing, we can check that this a n zero is in the image of some a n one from this other group. That can be checked by testing whether a certain cup product vanishes. Now, when we work out what this means, it turns out that the vanishing of this cup product can actually be checked locally in this case. We can localize at the place f um, the place corresponding to the polynomial f in P1. And computing this cup product turns out to a certain polynomial vanishing or being an elf power mod this factor f1 that I defined before. So the big picture here is that the set T determines which eigenvectors in V0 lift to eigenvectors in V1. So what we saw in this picture before is that the set T in this case would just be the set one, three, four, and six. Uh, two and five in this picture are not elements of the set T because they do not lift to V1. Okay, I'm going to take a brief break there. That was sort of a very in-depth look at things. Um, Should I go until 55 and then ask questions? Is there sort of a typical? Yeah, you can go up to 55, uh, Jonathan, if you want to. Okay.
Um, so I'll just briefly make an observation um, based on data. Um, and this is sort of the one result that we feel like we're close to proving, but aren't completely sure how yet. Um, so I showed you a similar graph or a similar table to this in the case L equals five. So we're looking at the five rank. Now we're looking at the seven rank and I've included the results from theorem two. So now notice that we have this extra contribution of T coming in. And depending on the size of T, we can actually put stronger bounds on the size of the seven rank. But interestingly here, knowing the set T is not actually enough to disambiguate between what the possible seven ranks are. So we compute some data, um, went through a bunch of different curves for various values of Q and D for L equals seven. And what we find is that certain options in this table do not occur. So I'm gonna zoom into this box here. So this is curves with degree, a multiple of six, and working over FQ, where Q is a primitive root mod seven. So it has order six mod, L, mod seven. And what we see in this data is that, you know, there's various curves that have T being size two, T can be size four, T can be size six. And we see various ranks occur, but we never find any curves of rank two or rank four. Um, we see lots of, so this is sort of saying over F3, looking at curves of degree six, we found 16 such curves of rank one. Um, here we have, you know, two sets where the set T is everything, everything mod six. And we found some curves with seven rank three and some curves with seven rank five, but we never find any with seven rank four. And in general, as we go through the data, the things that I crossed out in red, we have not found any curves satisfying any of these particular seven ranks. And so it appears to be true. And we have some heuristics for why this should be true, but no proof yet, is that it turns out that this bound here is not just an upper bound, but actually also a parity constraint. That in this table, everything occurs unless the parity of the L rank is different from the upper bound. Um, so that's ongoing. Um, we'd like to be able to say something about that, but um, it's an open, open for now. So I think that's all I have to talk about, and I'm happy to answer any questions.